can tell that I'm getting older because I'm looking forward to the day when I have grandkids. I like my, I mean, I like my children, but we have a lot of water that's gone under the bridge, and uh, it's fun to see them grow. It's fun to see them get a job. It's fun to see them graduate, go to college, get married. But I'm looking forward to the day when I get to go round two with the youngins, and uh, I look with great fondness at being able to make amends for some of the the parenting that I did and some of the missed opportunities and it really is a pleasure to be a part of the family and for me to actually look with you at your children and you look with me at mine and say these are ours as we make pledges as elders as deacons as members to care for one another's children and so we love seeing our children here we love seeing them worship we love it that we have people like Shelly and her whole staff that are operating on your behalf what a neat thing it is to be part of the family of God and not have to parent and grandparent on your own. So, back in the day, which for me is the 80s, maybe going into the 90s, there was that song, It's the End of the World as We Know It. We mention this quite often. And I'm just fine. And that's as good as I'm going to sing for you. And then came along the sitcom, I guess you're going to call it, of friends who made it kind of their mantra, their theme. We sang it all the time. And sometimes you look around you and you wonder, is it the end of the world? And am I just fine? I mean, it's a weird day, isn't it? We have fires and earthquakes and hurricanes. We have wars and we have rumors of war. We have protests and demonstrations and anarchy. We have viruses and pestilence. It seems like sin is growing and there's no leash on it anymore. And if we're not careful, we're looking around wondering who's the Antichrist. Some are absolutely convinced that uh, Donald Trump may be the Antichrist. Some are equally con convinced that he's the only thing holding back the Antichrist, and Mr. Biden may be the Antichrist. Some think that maybe some junior senator from New York, she might be the Antichrist, or some long-term politician from Charleston, he might be it. And we're looking around, we're trying to read the tea leaves, we're trying to read the signs. Oh, there's been a long, long history of people trying to figure out who's the Antichrist, when is the end of the age, and is it coming? I mean, this is nothing new. The Thessalonian church, they're struggling with this. The Thessalonian church, they've come to know Jesus. They're growing in discipleship. They're trying to serve Jesus. They're singing songs like, the cross before me, the world behind me, no turning back. And then the cross hits them. The cross of suffering. Paul had to flee Thessalonica because the mob got so bad. And he left them behind with some other teachers, but they're really struggling. They're struggling with the world. They're struggling with the devil who has his eyes set on them. He's like a roaring lion seeking whom he can devour. They're struggling with their own flesh. They know that they still sin. They hate it. But they're also struggling with the world, the flesh, and the devil, and with false teachers and preachers in their midst. False teachers had come and had said, you know, I have the spiritual gift of speaking in tongues, or I have the spiritual gift of receiving prophecy. And they said, I have a word from the Spirit for you. I have a word from the Lord. And other false teachers would come and they would say, well, God's given me the, the gift of logic and theology and I've been able to put the pieces together. And so I want to teach you. And I have some end time lectures for you. And then some had apparently even written a letter. And forged Paul's name on it. And delivered it to the church as if this was a letter from the Apostle Paul. It was a counterfeit. And these Christians in Thessalonica are really struggling. Because as they're looking at their world. They're looking around them at the wacky things that are going on. Someone has taught them that they've missed it. 
that Jesus Christ had already come back. Someone has taught them that Jesus had already come back, the parousia had happened, and that he had already gathered his elect, and they were gone, and these people had been left behind. And what was really tough was these people were going to see the dreaded day of the Lord. If you were to read your Bible in the Old Testament, you would know that the day of the Lord is nothing to laugh at or, or mock at, although people will mock it. It's a day of doom and gloom and anguish and crying out. It's a day of fire and brimstone, the judgment of God. It's the day when he removes his restraining hand, allows wickedness to devour the people, and then he comes in with his other hand and dominates anyone who's left. And so these Thessalonian Christians had read their letters, heard their lectures on eschatology, and were all messed up. They were deceived. They had swallowed the lies of many of the preachers and teachers around them that today the end of times is at hand and that you've missed something and that you're going to suffer in this way. And Paul is now writing a second letter to them because he loves them. He does not want them to be deceived, which causes them to be distressed. He doesn't want them to be shaken in mind. And this is what Paul is writing. So in chapter 1, he writes his introduction, and he's so gracious, as he always is, reminding them of who they are. Your people of grace, your people of peace, your people of faith, your people of love, your people who are persevering because God has his hands on you. Then he says, I'm boasting. I'm boasting about you people. You're my friends, and I'm proud of what God is doing. I want to tell God how happy I am for you Thessalonians. I want to tell other people, I actually do go to other churches and tell them what God is doing in you, with you, through you, and around you. I want you to know, so I'm writing it in my letter. And then Paul reminds them, you are God's beloved, and you are not going to suffer on the day when he comes back again. Oh, there's hell to pay for those who turn their back on God, but that's not you, for you are God's beloved. You are brothers. But now in chapter 2, he turns. And in chapter 2, he's now ready to help them understand eschatology. As he has already taught them before, as he has written in his letter, but he needs to remind them. So now let's read the text together. Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to him, we ask you, brothers, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed, either by a spirit or a spoken word or a letter seeming to be from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come or is at hand or has begun. Let no one deceive you in any way. For that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first. And the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? And you know what is restraining him now, so that he may be revealed in his time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work, only he who now restrains it will do so until he is out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed. The lawless one whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming. Well, the coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan, and he comes with all power and false signs and wonders and with all wicked deception for those who are perishing because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. Therefore, God sends them a strong delusion so that they may believe what is false in order that all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in righteousness. But that's not you. That's not us. But we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, beloved by the Lord, 
because God chose you as the first fruits to be saved. Through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. To this he called you through our gospel. That you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then brothers. Stand firm and hold to the traditions that you were taught by us. Either by our spoken word or by our letter. And now. May the Lord Jesus Christ. May the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And God our Father, who in the past loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace. May they comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. And so we see how we're supposed to respond. We're supposed to understand, first of all, that we, like the Thessalonians, are shaken and stirred. The world, the death, the world, the devil, and the flesh is coming after us, and it hurts. And just because we're Christians doesn't mean that we get to get out of all the persecution that's around us. Following Jesus Christ brings much affliction and even increased persecution. That's why Jesus Christ said things like, you're going to have to drink the cup of suffering with me. You're going to have to deny yourself and carry the cross. This is our lot. Oh, we get to rejoice. We don't have to go looking for suffering to make us Christians, to prove that we're Christians. We're not more holy because of the amount of suffering we receive. Some people do have a martyr complex where they think that the least that they can enjoy this life and the tougher they can make it on themselves, the more godly they must be. No. According to God's sovereign plan, suffering will come knocking on your door according to what he wants to allow. And when that happens, there are going to be all kind of false prophets. False prophets that are going to tell us things about the law. That if you would have obeyed better, you wouldn't hurt. No, sometimes God allows hurt to those who are obeying best. Or false teaching that says if you go through some kind of a timeout and some kind of a, a, a probationary period, your God may again look upon you with favor. No, he never stops looking upon you with favor. That, if, that if, you, if you believed more, if you had greater faith, you could have that health, wealth, and prosperity that they're promising on the big television network. No, that comes your way maybe in glory, for sure in glory, maybe on this earth, and isn't that fun when God does give us health, wealth, and prosperity? But he doesn't do so in accordance with our worship. There will be people around that will tell you about prophecies today that this is it. This is the end. Maybe it is. I almost have to say the odds are it's not. Because in every single generation, people have thought it was. It looks like some of the apostles thought Jesus might come back during their time. We have the Montanists who went and traveled and, and lived in the desert and on the mountains. We have ancient people that wrote prophecies we have people today trying to dig up what Nostradamus said. We have the hen lady of Leeds. Do you know about that in the 18th century? In the 1800s, the 19th century. Evidently, she had these chicken in Le chickens in Leeds who would give eggs. And on the eggs, it said, Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. She proved to be a fraud as she was actually taking acid, writing on there, Jesus is coming, and then reinserting them back in the chickens. Kind of weird. We have people in every age looking at Y2K. If you've ever listened to family radio because you've been traveling about, there was that man, Harold Camping, who was absolutely sure in 1992 that it was going to be 1994. Then it was 2017, I believe, or something like that. And he got it wrong in March, so he moved it to October, and finally he's passed away. He knows better now. It was not the end of the world. We have Heaven's Gate, that cult. There are always people saying, we know the end is now. And we know who the Antichrist is. Some have reasoned it was Adolf Hitler. Some have reasoned it was a certain pope. Or then the next pope. Or then the next pope. And they actually equated the, the papacy with the Antichrist in the Reformation period. Some, as I said, look around at politicians and are wondering, 
wondering if the mark on Mikhail Gorbachev's head was the mark of the beast of some sort. Some thought Ronald Reagan was the Antichrist because Ronald Wilson Reagan has six letters, six letters, and six letters. Barney the Dinosaur, the little purple dinosaur, I love you, that kind of song that we used to sing, some of you might have. Have reason that if you take his name and you put it in Latin letters and then you remove Roman numerals, it becomes 666. And we laugh. I don't know who Kissinger was, but evidently people thought he might be the Antichrist because he was working so hard for peace in the Middle East. But there have always been people who have told you this is it, this is the end. And they teach wrong doctrine in regards to eschatology, in regards to soteriology and your salvation, in regards to all the different theologies. And when you believe wrongly, the result is just what you see here. They were alarmed in their mind, and it caused them to be troubled in their emotions. An interesting thing you can study later this afternoon is Acts chapter 17. In Acts chapter 17, Paul is writing to the noble Bereans who are not like the Thessalonians because the Bereans heard teaching and then went back to the scriptures to see if it was indeed true. That's what we should do. We're stirred and we're shaken, but there's no reason for us to respond to the stirring and the shaking that's happening by God like unbelievers do. So Paul is now writing, and he's saying, hey, my friends, you're wrong. It's not the day of the Lord yet. Let me tell you why. There's this man of lawlessness or this son of destruction that must come first. Now, it is true, my friends, that the man of lawlessness and the son of destruction has the law or the mystery of lawlessness that's already at work. There is already this antichrist theme going on through culture in first john he talks about the antichrists leading to the antichrist and so it is true that there is this lawless mystery that is going on now and it is true that there is a man of lawlessness and a son of destruction that is coming he is one that is going to be inspired and empowered by satan He's one that's going to be able to show up as a man and he's going to be able to do miracles and wonders and signs. He's going to look like he's an apostle of truth. But he is one that ultimately is going to do all that because he loves himself and he's going to exalt himself and he's going to see himself higher than all the gods, even the God. And he... Some believe there's going to be a real temple reconstructed. I don't think so. If there is, he's going to find himself seated on that throne. Others believe that the temple of God represents in Pauline language the church of God here. And he's going to find himself right smack in the middle of the church, elevating himself, enthroning himself, sitting in the midst of God's people. And he's going to be so arrogant that he's going to point to himself to be worshipped. And he's going to be successful. There's going to be a rebellion. The better word is an apostasy. So successful is this false teacher that people are going to be stirred and shaken. They're going to start following him. And ultimately, this man of lawlessness, this son of destruction who's going to be incredibly successful is going to be vanquished because Jesus is coming. And Jesus is coming, and Jesus is going to destroy him easily. Easy. Some might say easy peasy. Just like he did creation, let there be. Just like he did the exorcisms when Jesus appeared in the Gospels. Get out. By the voice of his mouth, the breath of his mouth, he's going to take this most incredible, satanically inspired being, man, And he's going to destroy him. And the sad news is, he's going to destroy a lot of people as well. Those who are not brothers. Those who do not obey the gospel. Those who 
practice lawlessness and love wickedness. Those who won't believe. So I have to just stop there for a second. And I have to ask, where are we? Those are our two options. Over here are those who are suffering, stirred, and shaken. But they know Jesus is their Savior. They've, they've called upon Him to save them of their sin. They've understood that I can't do anything and I'm running to your arms and Jesus was already running their way. And these are the people who get to miss the hell described in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. These are people who get to miss the destruction by the breath of the mouth of the Lord in chapter 2. This can be you today. If you've never heard this before, you don't have to get religious. You don't have to be baptized. You don't have to take the Lord's Supper. You don't have to join a church. You don't have to do better. You have to just give up. Believe Him. Receive His free gift. And before you leave, even though you're stirred and you're shaken, you can be called a brother by Paul, a brother by Jesus Christ. But on this side, if you remain in your sin. And if you remain in your sin and try better, and though you may get religious, and though you may look good and make amends and spend money, go on pilgrimages, give away your time to works of charity, it doesn't matter because you're missing the way, the truth, and the life. And the bad news is your leader is going to fail you. He's going to lead you to destruction. The son of destruction is going to take you with him to hell. Why? Why would you perish? Oh, you're going to be stirred and shaken here. You're going to be stirred and shaken there. Paul is saying, why? Jesus is looking at you right now and he's saying, why? I'm offering you the free gift of salvation. Come on. I'm offering you escape from this. Come on. Listen to Jesus. If that spirit is stirring in your chest, all you do is respond in personal prayer. Because this is what God does. Paul says, that's not you. That's not what's going on with you. Because even though you are stirred and shaken, you are select. selected you're saved and you're secure you christians there's no reason for you to be distressed and running around like the sky is falling the sky is falling you christians it's the end of the world for somebody it may be the end of the world for you but it's the end of the world as you know it and you're just fine because god before time took out his black book and wrote his na- your name in it. He selected you either, and it depends on the manuscriptic evidence, as his first fruits, like you Thessalonians are about the first group that I'm gathering, but there's many more to come. That's a good translation if that's the manuscript. Or first in the order of time before creation, from the beginning. And there's good manuscriptic evidence for both. But he's saying, you people, there's no reason for you to be distressed. Jesus has set his affection on you, and he never changes. He never lets go. And you people, you have been saved. I mean, consider you people. This is what he's saying. Remember, there's all these people over here that aren't believing. That's what characterizes them. But you are people who have been sanctified by the Spirit. You have believed in the truth. You are people over here who heard our gospel and responded properly. Do you realize what that means? All of you right now, I think, get to look in your own heart, in your own mind, and say, do I believe? If the answer is no, you already know. I'm over here saying, come to Jesus. If the answer is yes, you get to say, why do I believe when other people don't? Why do I see when other people are blind? Why do I hear when other people are deaf? Why is my heart softened 
Why do I care about my sin? Why am I running to Jesus that I cannot see? Why do I have faith? The answer is, you have been made a saint by the Holy Spirit. It starts with the Holy Spirit. He regenerated you, gave you the gift of faith. You responded then. You really did believe. You really did repent because you heard the gospel. So you ready? Everybody look. Breathe in. Breathe out. You can rest. You can rest in the fact that you have faith, which identifies you as someone whom the Lord has already saved. Oh, you've been selected. You've been saved, but then look what the text says. You have been set up for glory. One day, Jesus is coming again, and when he comes, it's going to be a day of dread and doom for some, but what a day that will be when we see Jesus. Oh, glorious day, because our best friend, our Savior, our Lord, the one who has loved us in the past, loves us in the present, and loves us in the future, who holds none of our sins against us because he's already paid for him. One day, he's coming back. And when he does, how fantastic that will be, for we will see his glory. We will be taken up into glory with him. We will be perfectly glorified. And all the glory of Jesus that's his will be glorious to us. So you're seeing now the text as Paul is writing to these people. Man, it may be the end of the world. They're stressed out. They're stirred and shaken. And it's going to get worse for them. But for you who are my brothers in Christ, my sisters in Christ, it may be the end of the world. And you may be stressed out. And I know you're stirred and you're shaken but there's no reason for you to be. The greatest being in the universe has predestined you. He has saved you from all of your sins. And he has promises that it's only going to get better for you. Therefore, how do we respond? Now you're ready for the great exhortation and the benediction. He says, stand firm. How do you stand firm? You stand firm by getting in the scriptures and figuring out the truth and not listening to the lie. You stand firm in that day to the Thessalonians by listening to what we have said, listening to what we have written, listening to what we say are traditions, and you doing those. So we stand firm by listening to what our apostolic fathers have said, that which has been written, that which has been preserved, that which has been canonized, and we look at everything through the lens of Scripture, and the more we're in the Word of God, the more we're not listening to the lies of the world, our own flesh, or the devil, the more we're not listening to the false teaching and preaching that is abounded in every generation, the more we're in the Word of God, listening to our Father's voice, we will be able to stand firm. Remember how they were? They're shaken in mind. They're a little rocky. We're in concrete. We're immovable. We're not double-minded, being tossed about by every wind of doctrine back and forth. So stand firm in the Bible. The application's very, very simple. Maybe this sermon has helped you because we've been in the Bible together. Maybe if you went and read this afternoon, it would be really good for you. For you would be reminded of some psalm or some other story. And God would encourage you to think properly after him. This is what happens when our minds are transformed by the word of God. Horizon Church, join me and us. Join the elders in getting in the word of God as much as possible. We do it online. We do it in person. We do it on Sunday. We do it on all the fun days. Come on, join with us. Go from milk to to meet every day meditate on god's truth for the one who meditates is like a tree that prospers it says in psalm chapter one the word of the god the word of god is good get in it with us personally in small groups and as the large group oh may we be people who were and we still are stirred but may we be people in the word standing firm so that we know we are the saved 
We are the sanctified. I could use some more S's. We're the selected. We're the secured. We learn this from the Bible. And it refutes all the false messages coming our way. But finally, look how the text ends. So, I can imagine Paul walking back and forth like this. Maybe he sat down. And he's going, so my stirred, shaken, troubled, stressed out friends. It could be the end of the world as we know it. (laughs) And you're all right. Now, may Jesus Christ himself your best friend the one who's praying for you at the throne of God in heaven the one who has the father's ear like no one ever has the one who's pouring out his love on you and comforting you and encouraging you may Jesus himself personally along with his father which happens to be our father God the father I think you could add the spirit as well May the Trinity establish you and comfort you. And may they empower you for every good work and word. That's how we walk out of here. We walk out of here as people who were in danger of being stirred and shaken. And if you read chapter 3 of becoming lethargic, like what do we do? nothing's worth it our work ethic and our responsibilities aren't that important we're getting lazy for the kingdom i'm just going to kind of wither up go live on a mountain and wait for jesus to come again or i'm going to take all my trophies and hide them in the ground and not be a good steward and wait for jesus to come again or it's incredibly bad and the world the flesh the devil and the antichrist have got to be all around and it looks like they're winning and so now i'm going to be defeated oh no no if you are people who are standing firm May Jesus Christ himself, the Father in heaven and the Spirit who dwells within, equip, empower, encourage those who have comforted us in the past. May they do good work right now. And may we as a church spend the rest of our days doing good works and speaking good words. Good works with each other. Let's encourage each other as the day approaches. Let's gather even more as the day approaches. Let's look for our brothers and sisters who are stirred, shaken, and lied to, and let's speak gospel truth to them. Let's visit with one another. Let's greet one another with a holy kiss. Let's invite each other into our homes. Let's get our spiritual gifts and start using them. These are good works that we can do for the family. In addition, let's get outside the church and engage in good works. Mixing with those who don't know our Savior. Visiting with them. Listening well befriending them debating with them in such a manner that it it doesn't lead to war but it kind of gives them the opportunity to want to know more about this truth that you have let's talk different text different snapchat different post different let's be engaged in works and in words as we tell them about god's word we tell them about god's law We tell them about God's gospel. We tell them about God's family. We invite them to come. You see, as Christians, waiting for that final glorious day when Jesus comes again, we are not apathetic. We're not lethargic. We're not isolationists. We're not joining a commune and kind of just gathering ourselves. Today, we have come together to be encouraged by the Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father. And may they cause us to get out of here the rest of this week and share good works and good words with others that they might know our Savior. I don't know how many years until the Lord comes back. Could be today. Could be this year. Thought Y2K might have been it. I don't know how many years you and I have left. 
Somebody that was in Jim's Bible study that's been a friend of many of you is now at home with the Father. Some of you have lost loved ones this year. I don't know if 2020 will result in a funeral of someone who's here. 2021. Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know if we have five years left, 25 years left. Even the youngest of you here, I don't know how many years you have. But what would Christ have us do? Christ would have us get in the word. Not be stirred and shaken. Be educated by Paul and the other apostles and prophets who have written for our benefit. And then he would have us be firm, be steady, and go labor on. May God help us not to be people who are shaken in mind and alarmed, but people who are steady, steadfast, standing firm, sharing God's love in word and deed. It's the end of the world. As we know it. And we're just fine. Let's pray. Father, we ask that you would help make this a reality. It's a little bit easier sitting in the cool air, in the comfort of our chairs, with a community of friends around us, in a country that still allows us to practice our Christian liberties and worship. It gets a little tougher, Lord when it looks like Satan and sin is having its way with us and our families, the nation that we love. But help us to realize that there have been good days and bad days in every generation, that nations come and nations go, but that you're good. Your kingdom is coming on earth as it already is in heaven. And that for believers, we live, we die, and then comes glory. May we not be shaken by winds of doctrine. May we be people that are in the scriptures and help us to want to read your Bible and listen to your teachers more and more. And then, Lord, help us because we get to get out of here and share good works and good words. May you yourself, Lord Jesus Christ, may you personally, Lord Jesus Christ, through your Holy Spirit that you've implanted in our hearts, impress upon us our reality as brothers. And may we share your name spread your glory throughout the upstate and around the world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.